So my name is uh, Srijana and I am the AJV immigration expert based out of Toronto um, in Canada. Uh, and um, I will give you uh, your, my perspective um, from Canada and all of the developments, uh, government announcements, etc. Uh, that should benefit um, everyone who is viewing me uh, from around the world. Um, and also, as I said already, uh, take questions at the end. Um, it's sort of a rather cold morning uh, in Canada, um, and you know I hope for people joining me from India and um, you know for the from the rest of the world, um, you know I hope you're all well um, and that uh, this will be an informative session for everyone. So I will start with a few uh, immigration updates. Uh, the first one, of course, uh, is COVID-related, uh, and since. This is this particular story has you know pretty much taken over the world. Uh, there have been uh, a few student-related uh, COVID updates, um, you know, that the government uh, has made, uh, and I will come to uh, about two or three announcements. The first one uh, was with regard to um, can students travel uh, to Canada. Uh, and this is uh, this isn't necessarily a recent update, uh, but it was an update that came a while back, but is still very pertinent uh, and important uh, for students. Um, and the update is that if you have um, an approved study permit, uh, and if you are studying at a designated learning institute whose COVID plan uh, has been approved by the provincial government, you can travel to Canada. So, um, you know, there are no restrictions. You can come in uh, at the border. They're going to ask you about uh, which institute you're going to be studying with and if their plan, COVID readiness plan, has been approved by uh, the provincial government. Uh, and if the answer to that is yes, uh, then you can come and study in Canada. Uh, if you want uh, a list of all uh, designated learning institutes whose COVID readiness plans have been approved by the government, uh, the list is there on all of uh, the Government of Canada websites. Uh, whenever you are taking information on Canada, uh, immigration uh, rules, etc., in particular, uh, make sure you're always going to uh, the government.ca site uh, because information from any other site or from any other publicly available source cannot, of course, be vetted. Uh, the second uh, update, of course, um, you know, is, uh, you know, the associated one relates to COVID, which means uh, you have to provide a COVID negative result to the airline when you're boarding your flight. And when you come here, there is a, a mandatory 40 uh, day uh, quarantine period, of course. So all of those arrangements have to be made before you uh, travel uh, to Canada, uh, that you have a, a secure place uh, where you can quarantine uh, and that you will have uh, help provided, um, you know, in terms of all of your uh, needs once, once you're here. Um, biometric centers, etc., cetera, uh, in India um, are now open with appointment only. So you have to contact the biometric center in advance, get your slot, uh, and then go there on that designated day and time uh, to provide biometrics. Um, the visa offices are still accepting and processing uh, applications online. Uh, so that continues to be um, you know, a process that's going on uh, fairly um, uh, you know, business as usual. But of course, there are associated delays with processing. Uh, but uh, there is no stop to um, the uh, accepting of applications and the processing of those applications. Uh, the other important uh, student-related announcement has been uh, for uh, students who were on postgraduate work permits. So uh, many of you may be aware that after you study in Canada, um, after your study uh, period is over, uh, you get an associated postgraduate work permit that allows you to gather experience in Canada. Uh, so um, the, the latest announcement uh, is that anybody who's postgraduate work permit expired on or after uh, the 30th of January, 2020. Um, they have now been given um, extensions for another 18 months uh, and they have been given open work permits. Uh, and this is um, an opportunity uh, for people whose job search or job hunt was impacted by the COVID situation, uh, which I'm guessing um, and many people were affected with uh, because um, the job situation during the time of COVID was tough. So anybody who was on a postgraduate work permit uh, who found it really, really difficult uh, to find a job in Canada uh, because of all of the, um, uh, you know, I guess, um, COVID affected um, the economy status, 
they now have an extension of 18 months. And this is, um, you know, this is quite, um, uh, it, it's quite an exceptional sort of announcement because uh, the postgraduate work permit is a one-time allowance uh, for students to find work. And it's never happened before uh, that people were given another opportunity to move to another work visa right after their postgraduate work permit. But this is uh, tough times, um, you know, asking for tough measures. Uh, and um, because the government is cognizant of how difficult the times have been uh, in terms of finding employment, um, you know, they've been given uh, the opportunity to work uh, for another 18 months. And um, people who had postgraduate work permits that expired on or after the 30th of January, uh, 2020, uh, can now work for another 18 months. Um, uh, another uh, announcement that happened uh, just the day before yesterday was the announcement on cooperative uh, programs. So people, students who are on co-op programs, uh, whose uh, study permits and work permits are being processed. They can actually start work um, either in their home country um, or they can start work for um, you know, a Canadian uh, organization, uh, but they can work from home. Uh, so this is another sort of uh, development. Uh, and this is, of course, um, I guess the government you know, facilitating um, you know, the, the, the movement of applications as much, um, even during times of COVID. Uh, and this is the one uh, differentiating uh, factor, uh, I guess we can say with Canada, uh, that while uh, a whole lot of other countries have come to a standstill in terms of visa application acceptance and processing, uh, Canada continues to make, um, um, you know, to make progress uh, in terms of trying to bring people here. Um, and we know students is, um, you know, is, is a significant, um, um, you know, what can I say, a revenue contributor, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, capital coming uh, into Canada and, and therefore um, Canada has been uh, particularly facilitative uh, to students and their applications. Um, and, you know, having made, um, I guess, my point on all of the updates uh, and the announcement that the government made, uh, I think it's a good segue into our next segment, which is um, the study uh, to decide pathway in Canada. So like many other uh, sort of countries, Canada is a very, um, you know, study to reside sort of market for the rest of the world. Uh, when I say study to reside market, it means a lot of people come to Canada to study uh, and continue to stay on and eventually get on uh, to applying for their permanent residence and subsequently citizenship, etc. So uh, in terms of facilitating that pathway and moving from one sort of visa to another, uh, in order to actually chart out a longer time, um, um, you know, immigration story, um, Canada is a fairly uh, facilitative one. Um, you can come and uh, study in Canada and do a variety of courses. You can choose from undergraduate courses to postgraduate courses to doctoral degrees, of course. Uh, and then there is, um, you know, the ever so popular sort of MBA course. Um, and there are, um, you know, about, uh, there are, you know, thousands of of of, uni uh, of institutions, universities, private, um, you know, DLIs, uh, providing courses. And the only thing that you have to make sure um, that you are vetting uh, before you come to Canada is that your institute is an approved DLI. The word DLI is very popular in Canada. DLI means designated learning institutes. It means uh, an institute that has all of the necessary permits uh, and approvals to provide the particular course of your choice legally. Uh, so you have to make sure that it is a designated learning institute and that you are being given a full-time seat uh, for that particular course. So these are the two important things to note. Um, uh, so in terms of um, you know applying for admissions in Canada, uh, there are two very, very popular intakes, uh, and that is uh, the fall and the winter intake. Uh, so, um, you know, I guess you can start, um, you know, looking up uh, institutes in Canada, do your necessary research. Um, Canada does not have, um, you know, a, a formal sort of rating um, system for institutes. But if you go on Google, uh, there will be a number of, um, um, you know, I, I guess agencies and, um, you know, rating bodies uh, that have done sort of a chronological uh, 
rating of institutes in Canada. Uh, the universities, uh, not surprisingly, are right on top of that list. Uh, and if you choose universities in India, uh, you will be fairly well assured that the quality of education will be great. Uh, that is not to say the private institutions um, you know, are, are not good enough. Uh, but of course, in terms of hierarchy of where uh, the institutions stand, uh, the universities, of course, come on top. Uh, and there are a variety of courses uh, to choose from. Um, there are a number of popular fields uh, in Canada. Um, the most popular one right now, uh, not, not surprisingly enough, is artificial intelligence. Um, Quebec, um, which is, uh, you know, sort of the, the French province uh, in Canada, is um, the, the one that's becoming extremely popular for uh, AI or artificial intelligence. Uh, the other popular fields are um, data analytics or data analysis. Uh, computer science is very popular for students from um, uh, the Indian subcontinent and you know the associated regions. Uh, pharmacy is also very popular in India. Uh, at number five, um, in, in Canada, sorry, uh, at number five, we have business. Uh, number six, nursing and midwifery is another uh, popular area. Uh, now, healthcare, uh, of course, is, is becoming uh, sort of more important than ever. So there is a very large uptake for, um, you know, healthcare courses, um, nursing and midwifery included. Uh, human resource management uh, is at number seven. Um, I'm just kind of listing out popular um, areas of study in Canada. And number eight is architecture. Uh, number nine is um, dentistry or dental studies. Um, and and then, um, you know, we also have um, all of the other um, sort of, I guess, short term uh, certificate courses um, at, at the end of that list. So um, and in no way is this list, um, you know, a comprehensive one. Uh, but I guess it's only indicative of uh, where students are headed. So um, as uh, expected, uh, a large chunk of it uh, are the IT courses. So AI uh, data analytics, et cetera. And then we have healthcare. Uh, and then we have sort of the, the general business, uh, human resource management, marketing, sales, et cetera, kind of courses. Um, so once you've um, chosen your, um, your, your field of study or course uh, in Canada, uh, you will, of course, um, apply for uh, a study permit and a TRV uh, and once that is approved, you make your way to Canada and then you start pursuing your course. Uh, while you are studying, uh, as I said already, there are two important points. Um, if you're a full-time student uh, and if you are in a designated learning institute, uh, then you get work rights, uh, associated work rights, uh, which means you can work indefinite hours on campus uh, and off campus, you can work 20 hours a week. Uh, that is uh, the government provision mm, as far as work allowance is concerned for students. So if you're working in campus, uh, so there are lots of in-campus opportunities. Um, if you ask me for an example, um, you know, it could be you're working for, uh, say you're working as a teacher's assistant, you're working as a professor's assistant, or you're working um, in the library or you can even start your own venture in campus. Um, as long as it's within the confines uh, or within the limits of the campus, uh, you can work indefinite hours. So there are no restrictions in terms of how many hours you can work. Uh, it's um, indefinite uh, number of hours uh, as far as you're working in campus. Outside of uh, the campus, if you're working for, um, you know, like uh, a, a lot of, um, you know, formal employers, or you're working for, let's say, um, you know, a retail chain, or you're working for, you know, even places like Tim Hortons or Starbucks, etc. You can work 20 hours a week. Uh, you're not allowed to work um, beyond that as a student. Um, for any other kind of work, um, for, for any kind of, um, you know, paid employment of other kind, uh, which is a part of your uh, curriculum. For example, if you're doing a co-op uh, course, which requires you uh, to work with another employer as part of the curriculum, uh, please note that you will need both a study permit and a work permit uh, for this kind of work. Mm, so if you are choosing uh, co-op programs, which I hear are extremely popular in India um, and also uh, sort of in other countries because um, you know students do want uh, an essential work component uh, as part of their entire study experience in Canada. Uh, and if you are choosing a co-op course, you will need a 
both a study permit and a work permit. Uh, and this uh, will again mandate the number of hours that you can work. Uh, your work cannot be more than 50% of the curriculum. Uh, so those are the caveats as far as uh, working in Canada is concerned. Uh, once you have completed um, your desired course or your choice of course in Canada, uh, you have to apply. Uh, while you're eligible, you don't. it's not handed to you automatically. It's not that at the end of your study, someone from, um, um, you know, Citizenship, Refugee and Immigration Canada comes and says, here you go, here's your uh, work permit. You have to apply for a postgraduate work permit. Uh, and the duration of your, the postgraduate work permit is linked to the currency of your study visa. So if you have uh, done any course that is under eight months, uh, you are not eligible for a course postgraduate work permit at all. Um, and if you have done a course uh, between eight months and 24 months, uh, the postgraduate work permit duration is going to be linked uh, to the duration of your study permit. Uh, and the maximum duration of the postgraduate work permit is, of course, three years uh, for people who've done a course of three years or more. So um, please note that the duration of the postgraduate work permit is um, directly linked to the currency of your study permit, and therefore it depends on how long your course in Canada was. Um, so this postgraduate work permit is what we call uh, in immigration parlance, it's an open work permit, which means you can work for any employer anywhere in Canada uh, and you can choose, you can sort of change employers uh, at any point in time. So this is, um, uh, I guess, Canada's way of, uh, you know, if I may say so, rewarding uh, students who have uh, gained education in Canada. And I guess it's the government's way of saying you can now uh, look for uh, employment in Canada. Um, and um, the, the great thing about uh, the postgraduate work permit uh, is that uh, it allows you a real shot uh, at getting residence in Canada because once you've worked for a year uh, in Canada under a temporary visa, um, postgraduate work permit included, uh, you can then claim points for um, work experience in Canada and uh, apply under apply for residence under this particular class called CEC, which is the Canadian Experience Class, which means it is for those people who have acquired uh, work experience in Canada. So once you have full-time paid work experience in Canada for at least a year, uh, you can apply for uh, the, the you can apply for residence under this particular category, which is CEC, the Canadian Experience Class. So this is why um, you know the study to reside pathway is a particularly popular one in Canada because once you study, uh, you move on to working in Canada, and then you um, have a real shot at applying for permanent residence um, in Canada if that is your long term goal. Uh, but I guess um, studying in Canada is also a particularly valuable experience, even if you do want to go back to your home country uh, because of, um, you know, the fact that it is uh, a fairly recognized um, education system, uh, you know, in, in the global, uh, you know, positioning of, of universities and, um, you know, in, in, in the way uh, degrees are valued. Uh, and so there is value even if you want to go back to your home country and, uh, you know, either pursue a career back in your home country or uh, start some sort of an entrepreneurial venture. There are enough people doing that as well. Um, data shows that 90% uh, of students uh, do get employed uh, in Canada. Um, you know, of course, COVID has been a particularly difficult time and, and the job situation isn't as easy. Uh, but COVID notwithstanding, 90% uh, of students uh, do end up uh, getting employed uh, in Canada, which means there are enough uh, job opportunities. Um, and, you know, uh, a lot of people ask me about, you know, finding a job, etc. But I think, um, you know, we have to realize that finding a job uh, at the end of the day is, is a fairly sort of subjective um, issue. Uh, and that I cannot sit here and objectively say everybody's going to find a job. It really depends on the quality of the course, uh, you know, what you're studying, uh, the networks that you've built while here, um, you know, how much have you tried exploring the market? Uh, you know, did you get any internship at all? Uh, how good are your language skills? 
Um, you know, is your resume updated? Um, you know, does it sort of carry significant weight? So a lot of finding a job in Canada is really sort of an, an, an individual uh, endeavor. Uh, but in terms of generic uh, statistics and data, 90% um, of students uh, do end up finding reasonable employment in Canada. That's what the data says. Okay, um, so that was the uh, sort of study uh, to uh, reside pathway. Um, if you are curious about, um, you know, the Canadian experience class and how does that work, etc., um, you know, I promise to, you know, possibly do another live session on uh, attaining residence in Canada. Uh, but I'm just giving you a, a brief snapshot of that information as part of today's session. Um, continuing with sort of, uh, you know, the job market and um, you know, what are the areas uh, really? Um, as I said already, Quebec is is, is fast uh, developing as uh, the AI center uh, for Canada. Uh, a lot of you may have heard of the province of Quebec, um, where French uh, is popularly spoken as the first language. Um, while it is um, advantageous to sort of know French uh, already if you are coming to Quebec or if you are going to apply as a student, uh, but that is not sort of mandatory in any way. Uh, you can learn French in, in Quebec um, after sort of you arrive here and uh, the, the provincial government has incentivized uh, the learning of French for both permanent residents and students. So there are a lot of free French classes being offered uh, in Quebec that you can be a part of, um, but um, work, uh, work visas, study permits, etc., are being granted even uh, to people who do not know French, uh, and it's not a definite prerequisite, but um, you know anybody wanting uh, to study and work in Quebec, it's important to realize that French is uh, the, the primary or the first language, uh, and that you will be disadvantaged a little bit if you don't know French, uh, but you can very easily learn once you're here, or um, you know if you are sitting in India right now, or anywhere in the world and toying with the idea of um, you know, learning another language, uh, French might hold you in good stead. Um, Toronto, of course, uh, which is in the province of Ontario, is, um, you know, we call it the, the Silicon Valley of Canada. Um, I don't know if that comparison is, um, you know, quite called for or, um, you know, is even sort of remotely accurate, but uh, this is where most of uh, the IT and the business jobs are. But similarly, um, you know, other provinces and other popular cities, uh, Vancouver in British Columbia, um, you know, there are also other sort of provinces uh, that are now uh, more popular with, um, you know, migrants and foreign students, um, Alberta, etc. cetera. Um, you know, there will, um, you know, there are enough uh, jobs. And if you, um, you know, look at uh, some of the popular job sites in Canada, for example, um, you know, we have something known as the job bank. Um, um, that's sort of the, the popular um, you know, repository of all uh, open jobs in Canada. Uh, we also use a little bit of Indeed here. Um, it's, it's a fairly popular job site. Uh, there's one called All Stars. Um, these are op uh, popular um, job posting sites in Canada. If you just um, you know, have a peripheral look at these job sites, you will get uh, a rough idea uh, of the kind of jobs that are being offered, uh, the compensation per annum. Um, you know, that is given uh, for various positions um, in various industries, you will get a broad idea uh, of what are the popular jobs. Um, but I guess for students completing uh, their courses in Canada, there is a fair uh, uptake uh, and employers, um, you know, do, do get sort of encouraged to hire students because of, A, um, you know, the Canadian education system, um, and B, um, you know, you've also developed fair sort of language and soft skills while studying in Canada. Uh, so, um, you know, you will be able to crack the interview better or even sort of impress, um, um, you know, the interview panel or employers, um, you know, with your language skills, et cetera, once you've been here for a while. Uh, so finding a job if you've completed um, a course, a credible course from a DLI, uh, should not be a particular issue, uh, but it also really, really depends on how you leverage your postgraduate work permit uh, and trying to get as much practical experience um, while on your postgraduate work permit, because a lot of companies that take uh, students who are on a postgraduate work permit, uh, take them as, um, you know, full-time um, employees uh, once uh, sort of that uh, duration is over as well. 
Um, so we've already spoken about, uh, I guess, the currency of uh, the postgraduate work permit and the fact that it's largely linked to the currency of your um, study permit. Uh, but, and, and the maximum duration uh, is, of course, three years. Uh, and the postgraduate work permit is a one-time permit. Um, uh, at the very start of this session, I spoke about, uh, you know, government announcements and the fact that they were, um, you know, giving uh, people on postgraduate work permits another 18 months. But that is an absolute exception. Uh, the postgraduate work permit is a one-time work permit. And once you've held a postgraduate work permit, you cannot get another one. Uh, you have to move on uh, to, other, um, to other visas or apply for permanent residence. Um, in Canada. Uh, a lot of people, um, um, you know, have asked me uh, that, you know, if I'm interviewed and if I'm applying for a study permit, uh, is it kind of fatal to say that I want to uh, stay on in Canada and apply for residence? Um, the simple answer to that is that it isn't. Um, dual intent, what we call dual intent in Canada is a real thing. Uh, dual intent, um, as, uh, you know, the phrase pretty much suggests, uh, it means you have two uh, parallel intents. One is to come to Canada and be on a temporary work permit, which means to, or, or to be on a temporary permit, which means to study in Canada, work in Canada. Uh, but your other real intent is to uh, reside in Canada or to gain permanent residence in Canada. So, um, you know, visa officers, uh, you know, I guess interviewing students or, uh, you know, looking at applications are aware enough uh, that a lot of people coming on temporary permits want to actually move on to, um, you know, attaining residence in Canada. So we don't have to veil that or you don't have to necessarily camouflage that. Uh, it is fair enough to say uh, that you want permanent residence in Canada as your eventual aim uh, if you're being asked or if you're being interviewed or even when you have to write your, um, you know, your letter of intent or your submission letter. Okay, so we will now... Um, I guess, move on to um, the other. I'm also, um, you know, going to continue to check if, um, you know, there are any sort of pressing questions or comments uh, and continue with my updates otherwise. Okay, so... Um, in terms of, um, I guess, moving on to the next topic, which is uh, the cost uh, of education uh, in Canada, if you are curious about how much, uh, you know, does it cost really uh, to study in Canada? Um, there is no, um, you know, one answer sort of fits all here. Uh, the first um, answer is that it really depends on the course that you're choosing. Uh, but I can, of course, give you a, a rough ballpark. So if you are choosing an undergraduate program in Canada, uh, it can cost roughly between $13,000 to $20,000 per year. Um, and this is all figures in uh, CAD, which is Canadian dollars. Uh, so if you're choosing an undergraduate program, it can cost you anywhere between $13,000 to $20,000 per year. Uh, and you, know, you will recognize, of course, that this is a broad range, uh, but because there are so many undergraduate programs and so many specializations, um, you know, spread across different, um, you know, I guess, um, sectors and, and different subjects. So depending on what you choose, which institute and in also in which province, um, the, the cost will vary. But an undergraduate program will cost anywhere between 13000 to 20000 per year. Uh, a postgraduate uh, or program or a master's degree can cost anywhere between 17000 to 25000 per year. Um, if you are opting for a doctoral degree, which is a PhD, uh, a lot of these, uh, you know, provide scholarships. So that's why it can cost anywhere between 7000 to 15000 per year. And uh, if you are choosing uh, an MBA program, uh, then it can cost anywhere between 30000 to 40000 per year. Uh, MBA programs um, in Canada, as is with the rest of the world, uh, they're fairly expensive uh, and it can cost you anywhere between uh, 30,000 to 40,000 a year. So um, that is uh, a rough sort of, uh, you know, ballpark figures as far as cost is concerned. Um, and in terms of living uh, expenses, um, 
the you know there are fixed costs so um in terms of living expenses for the primary applicant or the student uh it is about 10000 uh, canadian dollars per annum uh and if there are uh, associated family members or if you're bringing in a spouse etc then uh the living expenses are calculated at 4000 canadian dollars per annum and for any subsequent family member joining uh it is about uh, 3000 um, canadian dollars per annum so let me repeat that uh for living expenses which um you know you have to demonstrate that you have uh, enough money to cover living expenses alongside your tuition so for living expenses it is for uh, the student or the primary applicant it is 10000 uh, canadian dollars uh for um the first uh, or the accompanying family member it is 4000 canadian dollars per annum and for any subsequent family member it is 3000 uh, canadian dollars per annum so if you are a student uh, if you're bringing your spouse along and if you have dependent children for you the student it will be 10000 canadian dollars living expenses for your spouse 4000 uh, canadian dollars living expenses per annum and for dependent general it will be 3000 a uh, canadian dollars per annum living expenses um tuition of course um you know I, i've spoken about already it really depends on which institute which course which province okay so um that's um you know a, a spiel on on cost of education in canada uh, there are of course various ways uh, of uh, accumulating funds uh, student loans um continue to be uh, popular um, a lot of uh, students from india in particular uh avail of student loans uh the canadian government website actually does have a list of banks uh that uh, did it's, it's not a recommendation list of any sort uh but um you know i guess these are banks that have historically provided um education loans um you know that have been accepted so um and it's a very comprehensive list uh it includes all of uh, uh, the the big banks in india as well uh so you can have a, um, you know check that list if you are going to opt for an education loan uh to cover your expenses in canada of course the other traditional uh sort of methods uh which is you know your own savings um you know getting money from parents uh, or other sort of financial sponsors uh is an, another way of acquiring funds but please note that if you are uh getting financial aid from um you know family members etc they all need to provide a uh, financial undertaking uh and um it is very very important to clarify um when when you're writing uh, your submission letter uh to to provide a paragraph on funds and to be very specific and clear about where um you know you manage to uh, gather all of the funds from who are the people who are helping you out um you know provide uh, financial undertaking forms and letters from them uh and provide a very very clear matrix of where the money is coming from um and how much um you know from each possible uh, contributor so uh that is for every student to explain uh and to provide uh, details of um the expense um you know another sort of question on expense is um you know is 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 it expensive are canadian um you know cities expensive and and that is a very sort of generic broad question because uh the answer to that is yes and no um 70% of uh people who come uh to canada um uh, and a significant sort of population is students as well uh all of them end up in uh pretty much uh, the larger centers uh and the two of the most popular cities are Vancouver and Toronto and both of these cities uh please note are very very expensive cities uh and therefore the cost of living is significant and you have to take that into account when you make your decision um while there may be job opportunities and you know they might be financial uh centers and um you know the vibrant downtowns in these cities where um uh, you know jobs might be available in plenty uh but um these are also very expensive cities so uh rent is expensive and average um you know one bedroom house um you know if you're bringing spouse and kids along uh can be anywhere upwards of $2000 per month uh and of course um you know for students there are a number of student accommodations etc that are available at a much cheaper cost uh but overall uh the cost of living is fairly high in uh, any one of uh, the bigger cities uh, in the more popular provinces in canada uh and therefore i guess um you know you can um opt to make a, a fairly unconventional choice um 
in which province and where you want to study, etc. So um, cost of living, uh, your cost of stay, etc. Uh, should definitely factor in uh, as far as your research uh, is concerned about where you want to study and where you want to stay, etc. Okay, so that was about uh, the cost of uh, studying. Um, if you ask about scholarships, um, Canada is actually one of those countries that is right up, um, you know, in sort of the, the hierarchy of countries in terms of uh, providing scholarships. Um, I will quickly list uh, a few of the, uh, the more popular scholarship um, programs uh, that are available uh, to students. Uh, the, the, the most popular one, uh, as far as India is concerned, is a scholarship which is known as the Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute Scholarship. Uh, and uh, this particular um, scholarship is for um, students at different levels, from graduates to postgraduates. Uh, and it is uh, also uh, particularly research and um, training focused. So it is going to provide uh, fellowships. Um, if you want uh, details, please Google all of these scholarships individually. I'm just listing out names uh, for you to, you know, uh, have some sort of lead as far as your research is concerned. So the Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute Scholarship is a popular one for students coming to Canada. Uh, the other one is known as the Canadian Commonwealth Scholarship and Fellowship Plan. Uh, Canadian Commonwealth Scholarship and Fellowship Plan. Um, this one identifies students with, um, you know, high grades, intellect from Commonwealth countries uh, applying to programs. Um, but these are for advanced studies. So anyone doing a master's, a PhD uh, program, etc. Uh, and I, I guess this is a, a significantly high amount. So the Canadian Commonwealth Scholarship uh, and Fellowship Plan, um, you can check that as well. Uh, provinces also provide scholarships to students coming to that particular province. So, for example, Ontario has the Ontario Graduate Scholarship Program, uh, and this is for uh, students opting for graduate studies in Ontario. Um, you have to, um, the only prerequisite to this one is that you have to accept an offer from a university in Ontario. So, that is the Ontario Graduate Scholarship Program. Uh, for anyone interested in coming to the province of Ontario. Uh, the other program is the National Research Council of Canada, NRCC, also provides um, scholarships uh, and fellowships to research, um, research uh, students, I guess, uh, anybody opting for um, a, a PhD, uh, particularly in the field of engineering uh, or other sort of natural sciences or engineering disciplines. So uh, anybody who is um, watching or who is interested in doing a PhD uh, in natural sciences or engineering, you should definitely be checking this particular uh, scholarship or fellowship program, which is the Nation National Research Council of Canada, NRCC scholarship. Um, the other one is um, also, uh, the other really popular one is the one that is um, given by uh, the province of Quebec. So it is known as the Quebec Provincial Government Scholarship. Uh, and uh, pretty much as the name suggests, it is only for students studying in Quebec. Um, and it is for students who are opting for a course at a master's level or above. Uh, and all of these applications are assessed on its own merit. So you have to apply to the provincial government. If you go uh, if you Google this particular Quebec Provincial Government Scholarship, it's going to provide you details about where to apply, uh, you know, what to submit, etc. But uh, you have to apply individually. Uh, there's uh, Ontario, of course, has another popular scholarship known as the Ontario Trillium Scholarship Program. Uh, there are also a lot of uh, grants by, um, by, by education bodies, like the Partnership Grants by Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Uh, and lastly, all of these scholarships are for PhD uh, students and candidates. So uh, anybody watching right now wanting to pursue a PhD, definitely, definitely um, have a look at some of the, the, the scholarship options available because uh, it's not just a scholarship, but it's also a very healthy stipend, uh, you know, that you might qualify for. So uh, that was a list of, um, you know, some of the important uh, scholarships that um, Canada does grant. Um, these are just the popular ones. Uh, apart from this, uh, every individual university or an institute uh, will have provisions for granting scholarship to extremely uh, meritorious students. So, um, you know, as part of your research, uh, please have a look at um, 
the scholarships page uh, that every uh, university or institute will have because there is a very high chance that you might be able to qualify for one of these uh, and that you will get a significant um, sort of uh, financial grant uh, as, as part of the scholarship program. So that was cost and scholarships. Um, what, um, you know, what differentiates the Canadian? Why is there so much sort of hullabaloo about, you know, education in Canada and why is it so popular? Uh, and, um, you know, I, I guess uh, that's a popular question. Um, I guess one is, um, you know, the fact that Canada as a migration destination is extremely popular. Um, you know, if you list, if you look at the list of, um, you know, any, um, if you look at any list that you know is about sort of the best countries to live in and the best cities to live in, uh, a lot of cities in Canada are very high on that list. Um, it was also UN endorsed in terms of quality of life uh, that Canada does have a great quality of life. Um, uh, the fact that uh, it is fairly um, immigration friendly, migrant friendly, um, offers a very quick residence and citizenship. Uh, is the definite uh, so as a destination uh, Canada is fairly popular um, there's also a wide variety of provinces and cities uh, to choose from um, and you know I guess work-life balance um, you know many say that but you know that really depends on sort of what work with city etc but by and large um, I think the quality of life in Canada has been fairly well endorsed uh, making it a fairly uh, popular country to migrate to so um, that's a, you know, a definite reason why a lot of students flock to Canada to study. Uh, but if I talk about the education system in, in particular, um, I think it is comparable to um, you know, some of the best sort of education systems in the world, uh, the US, UK included. Um, there are a lot of um, Ivy League equivalent uh, institutes in Canada, uh, very, very competitive, um, very um, selective in their uh, choice of students. Uh, but of course, even in terms of teaching style, methodology, etc., uh, Canada has a very, um, you know, what we'd call in India, very sort of a uh, practical uh, education system or style. Um, a lot of the work for students is um, research work, uh, and a lot of, um, you know, what we call assignments uh, that students do themselves. It's not this route method if you go to class and you listen to someone and that's the end of your lecture and you move on to, um, you know, studying for your exams and graduate. That's not, that's not quite the process in Canada. It's a very uh, practicum-based, uh, industry-focused, uh, very close association between academia and, um, you know, industry folks. So um, it's a very different, um, you know, teaching technique uh, and uh, a, a very unique learning experience for students uh, coming in from other parts of the world. Um, of course, it's also a very cosmopolitan classroom environment. So, um, you know, when you walk into your classroom, you will likely see a mix of people from around the world uh, that gives you a, a great learning ecosystem in terms of just uh, the sheer variety um, of experiences and cultures you will have access to once you're in a classroom. Um, also, uh, I guess um, a lot of the courses in Canada are very research heavy. Uh, so uh, if you're doing a master's a degree in particular, a PhD, of course, uh, even a whole lot of postgraduate programs, uh, it will allow you uh, a significant time for research or working with industry, uh, which is what you need uh, you know, to land reasonable employment here. Uh, so these are, I guess, the various factors that hold Canada in good stead uh, as far as education is concerned. Uh, and like we discussed early on, it is, of course, a very viable pathway for uh, staying on in Canada and gaining residence. Um, if you are asking me how uh, significant is, um, um, you know, studying in Canada in terms of the residence process, um, as I said already, um, once you have acquired work experience in Canada for 12 months, uh, you will qualify for what is known as residence under the Canadian experience class, even under express entry, which a lot of you might have heard of as, as uh, a quick way of gaining residence in Canada. Uh, you do get um, points for education in Canada. So uh, for um, you get between 15 to 30 points, extra points uh, under express entry for studying in Canada, depending on whether you've done uh, an undergraduate course or a postgraduate course, and depending on the duration of your course, uh, but you get between 50 to 30 points for education in Canada. Uh, and um, uh, a little bit sort of, you know, off topic, but you also get points for 
uh, arranged employment in Canada between 50 and 200 points. Uh, but um, finding employment in Canada when you're sitting in a country like India or when you are sitting in any other country is very, very difficult uh, because um, before a Canadian employer hands over an offer of employment to a foreign worker, uh, the employer in Canada has to prove to the government here that there was nobody in Canada who had the skills to do that particular job. So they have to advertise that job in all of the important work forums and also interview any permanent resident slash citizen who applies to that particular job. So that is a very, very difficult, long drawn process. And it's handled by uh, a government body in Canada known as ESDC, Employment and Social Development Canada. So, um, you know, handing over employment to a foreign worker um, by a Canadian employer, that is not an easy phenomenon at all. So, um, you know, if anybody is promising you employment in Canada and saying, oh, you know, you'll get a job offer, it's easy, you know, just pay us whatever amount, um, please be a little bit skeptical and critical of information like this, uh, because especially now in times of COVID, where a lot of people who are here already are finding difficulty with finding jobs, um, offering that pressure job to, uh, to somebody sitting uh, in another country is uh, a near impossible feat. So uh, the, therefore, uh, the best way of coming to Canada does become studying in Canada, investing, uh, you know, the time and the energy and the resources, uh, and then moving on to the postgraduate work permit, uh, and then applying for residence. It becomes a really lucrative, uh, viable pathway uh, for anyone, uh, you know, looking to live in Canada long term. So um, that is why. Uh, I guess, and also because um, the other um, express way of coming to Canada was, of course, residence uh, via the express entry program. Uh, but the draw scores have been higher uh, than normal now because of the COVID situation. Uh, and because it is becoming more and more difficult for people to come under the express entry program, uh, a lot of people who would have qualified otherwise, who would have qualified otherwise, um, are now uh, looking to study in Canada as well. Uh, and all of that aside, um, it is, uh, I guess, a, a worthwhile investment because, as I said, um, education, uh, a degree uh, that a Canadian Institute gives you will hold you in good stead, uh, you know, no matter which part of the world you're going to be in eventually. It will also allow you to build your networks in Canada, uh, get access to uh, employers uh, in Canada. There are um, a whole lot of uh, placement cells um, that universities and institutes have that will constantly sort of link you with potential employers uh, that you will not have access to if you were not a part of that institute. So there is value in um, coming and studying and being a part of um, you know, institutions of repute here because it's going to open your doors to employers, to um, you know, alumni. Their alumni associations are extremely valuable when you're looking for jobs um, or when you are trying to access people on LinkedIn and stuff like that. Uh, so it's not something that uh, people who come here as permanent residents, et cetera, have access to. Uh, also, um, you know, if you are, um, you know, wanting to better your language and communication skills, once you're here, uh, you know, talking to, you know, fellow students, your, um, you know, faculty members, staff, et cetera, you will, of course, better your communication. Uh, you will uh, have a better idea of life in Canada, social skills, et cetera. So, um, you know, there is uh, the amount of time that you spend studying in Canada is an extremely worthwhile investment uh, in terms of just, um, you know, how you're bettering your overall prospects of being in Canada are. So, um, you know, it's, it's definitely a recommended route uh, if you are willing to put in the time, energy and resources uh, and one that we'd recommend. Um, if you want uh, individual uh, counseling on your particular case, the merits of your case, uh, and if you will qualify for a particular course, which university, etc., I would recommend you to reach out to us uh, and we can do an individual analysis of your case. We have uh, counselors with AJV who will, um, you know, tell you about, um, you know, potentially what courses, which institutes in Canada and, you know, what your uh, you know, dream pathway in Canada could potentially be uh, and give you as much information. Um, and then it really depends on, you know, what you do with that information. But uh, please reach out to us with your individual cases. Um, if you do want uh, help uh, and individual uh, mentoring and guidance uh, as far as getting to Canada is concerned. Uh, but um, the, the, the visa process itself is significant. Um, Indians qualify for, um, you know, what is known as a student direct stream, 
And this is a, a, um, a facilitated pathway where um, it takes only about 20 calendar days to process an application instead of the usual two to three months that it takes otherwise. So the student direct stream uh, is for students in particular countries um, and India and China are uh, the two most important countries in that list. Uh, so, um, um, you know, a lot of you watching from India might qualify under the student direct stream for expedited processing. Uh, so the requirements are very specific. Uh, there are country specific checklists and requirements for students. Uh, so if you want help, um, you know, with, with any of those processes, uh, I would recommend working, uh, you know, with someone who is an expert in the field. Uh, and, um, you know, because I'm a licensed uh, professional sitting in Canada, I will have uh, oversight and overview of your application, um, you know, even while other people in the organization might be handling it uh, at the initial stage. So uh, I recommend um, that you reach out to us with the merits of your individual case uh, for us to have a look and really decipher, uh, you know, what the best options for you might be. Um, if there are questions, etc., I can uh, get to um, answering those now. Uh, team from other sort of platforms. If you want to forward questions at me, uh, I'm more than happy to take them now. Um, okay. Yes, um, the, the, the question on, um, okay. Okay, I may not have covered this already, but there is a question on, um, Spousal uh, work visas, um, which is uh, a good question. So um, when you are coming uh, to Canada as a student, as long as you're a full-time student and enrolled in um, a designated learning institute, uh, you are allowed to bring in your spouse. Uh, and the spouse qualifies for an open work permit, which means it is not employer brown bound, it is not location bound. The spouse can work anywhere in Canada for any employer. Uh, and the duration of the spouse's visa um, is linked to the duration of the student's uh, visa. So if you have a study permit for 24 months, uh, the spousal open work permit is also going to be uh, for 24 months. Mm, so the, the currency of your uh, spouse's work permit is linked to yours. Uh, and I think one of the definite advantages um, of coming to Canada is that uh, your spouse qualifies for an open work permit um, as long as you are a full-time student at a DLI, irrespective of what course you're doing, what level you're studying at, et cetera. So it's one of the, um, you know, I guess one of the, the sort of the important lucrative, um, I guess, points, or um, it, it's definitely an attractor as far as students is concerned, because you can bring your spouse along and uh, they qualify for an open work permit. Uh, as far as the application process is concerned, the spouse can apply at the very start with the student or uh, the spouse can apply separately or the student can also uh, apply on behalf of the spouse or put in uh, a spousal work permit once the student is here and has commenced classes. So there are various options. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of people believe that, um, you know, if you put in a spousal application at the very start, it might delay the student application process. Uh, you know, it's not entirely vetted information. There might be merit in that thought process. So uh, if, uh, if a spouse wants to apply at a later stage, uh, then that does become an option as well. But, uh, you know, there are basic, um, you know, documentation requ uh, required, which is, of course, the marriage certificate or, um, you know, if it's a recent marriage, etc., then details of the, the ceremony um, and, of course, um, passports with the name of spouse, etc. So all of the sort of regular documents uh, that you would need to prove partnership uh, are the documents that you would need here as well. Uh, but the fact that you can bring your spouse along uh, and uh, that it's not really level dependent and the spouse um, qualifies for uh, or the partner qualifies for an open work permit uh, is, of course, uh, another one of the, uh, the very um, lucrative tenets of, of this whole process. Uh, so thank you for that question. It's, um, it's, it's a good one and, and, and one that I should have covered. Yes, you can definitely bring your spouse along. And spouse can come on an open work permit. Um, yes, so um, the maximum duration of um, the post-study work permit is three years. Uh, and minimum, of course, is uh, eight months. If you've studied eight months, you're... Um, 
open work permit will be of that duration. If you have done any course under eight months, you don't qualify at all. Uh, but the more popular duration is two years. Uh, anybody studying between uh, eight months and two years, which is uh, what the uh, majority of the course durations are like, uh, then the postgraduate work permit is also for two years. Um, and, um, you know, the, the sort of likelihood is that in the two years, you would have acquired uh, enough experience to qualify for residence under the Canadian experience class. So uh, it gives you enough time to acquire those points, make a residence application and actually get an approval. So um, it's a great sort of, as I said already, it's a great study to recite pathway. Um, so that was on the duration. Uh, we have a lot of uh, individual sort of questions um, on um, you know, particular cases. So, uh, you know, I guess we will have um, someone look at your credentials and, and get back to you. Um, you can always sort of reach out to us. Um, and there was also a question on scholarships. So I listed a whole lot of scholarships. Uh, apart from that, uh, scholarships are granted to uh, meritorious students by uh, faculty members and institutes themselves. So, um, you know, every, if you are, um, you know, reaching out to institutes uh, and um, universities in particular, uh, you have to apply for scholarships. It's not that they're going to pick up your profile and give you scholarships. That might happen in a, in a few particularly meritorious cases, but you have to apply for scholarship and provide all of your sort of necessary documentation. Uh, so apart from the ones, the, the broad scholarships that I listed earlier uh, that are provided by governments, um, the federal government, provincial government, um, education education bodies, etc. individual institutes and universities uh, will also provide scholarships so you can reach them uh, individually. Uh, yes, there are, um, I guess, questions on engineering courses, nursing courses, scholarships, etc. Uh, those are, um, yeah, there are enough institutes uh, providing engineering, uh, nursing courses, uh, healthcare courses in Canada. Um, you know, reach out to us uh, and we will help you with which is the best one. Uh, and we can also look at scholarship options that are available for all of them. Okay, so, um, you know, I guess that was about um, the study in Canada proposition. And I am hoping that I have covered uh, all of the important points, including um, all of the government announcements uh, at, at the very start. The good news is that if you have an approved study permit, you can still come to Canada, uh, start your classes. Um, but please make sure that the Institute has an approved uh, COVID readiness plan. Um, all of this information is on the Government of Canada website, um, the um, govt.ca website. Uh, make sure you are um, depending on, on this particular website alone for official information. Uh, and um, you have to have a quarantine plan. Uh, and if you had an expired postgraduate work permit, you are now eligible for extension for another 18 months and they're giving you an open work permit. And the other important announcement was anybody on a co-op program uh, can start working uh, either in their home country or that they can take employment from a Canadian uh, employer and start working from home while in India or any other country. So these were the important announcements as far as students is concerned. Uh, I will of course make a comeback uh, and do uh, live sessions on other important processes, categories, etc., uh, to um, you know continue linking um, you know this as, as part of your overall uh, Canada immigration story. But whoever did participate today, thank you very much for watching. Uh, and uh, as I said already, please reach out to us with your individual questions and queries, uh, and we will try and and do um, uh, you know an, an, an intelligent sort of dissection of your case. Uh, and see where you stand and what can be done. So thank you everyone for taking the time out to uh, hear me out. Uh, and I look forward to interacting with you in the days ahead. Thank you very much.